there are many, many physical signs that we could use in medicine, and if we used them all, we would spend more than one day just looking at one patient. So what we have to do is work quickly and screen so that uh, we can isolate certain diseases which need to use those additional physical signs which we have in our heads uh, to apply and to work out uh, the cause of the sickness and the degree of it. So that will be our approach. And in order for there to be speed, we have to get the patient out as quickly as possible without being rude. So to do that, we start with him lying down and we do everything that can be done lying down. Then we make him sit up and then we there we do the things that should be done in a sitting position. Then we will have him dangle his feet over the side of the bed and uh, as you can see we're gradually taking him from lying, sitting to standing and then we watch his gait as he walks out the door. So this is the, the technique of, of using uh, uh, speed to get this patient through without him realizing that we're pushing him. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so we start out by, uh, first of all, by having some idea of what the problem is because we've already taken history. But as we do in our examination, new questions will come to our mind and we will ask those things. And normally the patient would answer, in this case, because it's all hypothetical, I'm going to uh, give the answers that I'm looking for. Okay. So the first thing we do then is <coughs> take his blood pressure in the lying position <coughs> and uh, <coughs> for that there are two things I want to say. This is a good kind of, of blood pressure cuff. Those automatic ones that pump themselves up can do damage and the damage they do is they put pressure on the medial cord of the brachial plexus and you get weakness in the ulnar nerve and in the median nerve and in the medial cutaneous nerves of the forearm. You can remember these by just saying that it's the medial head of the median, the ulnar nerve and then everything else is medial. So medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, everything is medial, and that is damaged if you use those automatic cuffs that pump themselves up and down. The other thing that I want to say about taking the blood pressure is that <clears throat> there is a thing called the auscultatory gap, and that means that when you pump the blood pressure cuff up uh, very high, you will be certain to find the systolic pressure and you will not miss the auscultatory gap, which is after you've found that high pressure, there's a silent period, and then the sounds come in again. If you only pump to that silent period, then your systolic pressure will be wrong. It'll be that lower pressure that comes in later. So in order to prevent that happening, always check the pulse at the wrist. And if you have, are feeling the, the pulse at the wrist, then you have not yet exceeded the systolic pressure and you have to pump a bit higher. So that's the first thing we do. Down. That's good. Did 
no pulse, so I'm above the systolic pressure. Now I'm letting the pressure down. The systolic pressure is 110. Diastolic pressure is 75. We're going to be taking his blood pressure again in the standing position, but for now we'll remove the cuff. And <clears throat> the next thing that, that we do while the patient is lying down is <clears throat> examine the chest, the neck, and the head we will examine in the sitting position. And for examining the chest, <clears throat> we look first of all for asymmetry. And uh, if you find that, uh, just lie a little bit straighter, the shoulder should be down, that's good, good. Now, if you find that this is not as built up as that, it could be that <clears throat> it's a muscular difference, but it could also be that there's some underlying chronic lung disease. And if that is so, then the trachea will be deviated. So you put your finger in the sternal notch and go back and you hit the trachea. His is exactly in the midline, so there's no atrophy in the lungs. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> then we we see whether both sides are moving e are moving equally as he breathes, and we notice whether his respirations are rapid or not. We're not uh, going to actually count them unless there's some suspicion that, they're, that they are too slow or too fast. And <clears throat> we're also going to put our hands on the chest and then ask him to take a big breath. Take a big breath. And as you notice, thank you, the costal margins go out on inspiration. That's because <clears throat> the diaphragms are contracting and <clears throat> The ribs are in a um, bucket handle arrangement, and they, when you when they pull on it, it goes like this. Then the next thing we come to is percussion. We use the clavicles, and you notice the sound is the same on both sides, and then we percuss, and that's normal. So is that. If we find that the heart is not palpable, or is not, uh, cannot be percussed, it's all resonant, then the patient has a pneumothorax or he has COPD. And COPD is the commonest. If he had COPD, the costal margins would have been pulled in because his diaphragms would have been flat. But we saw his costal margins went out, so we know he doesn't have COPD. And then we listen to the breath sounds. And in some patients, you have to get the patient to breathe a little deeper because breath sounds are not coming through well. So breathe a little deeper. Okay, and also while we're listening, particularly when we come to the back, we'll be listening for crackles or sometimes called rowls. Uh, these are very particular in their in their conformation because there are some which mean bronchial disease, there are some which mean alveolar disease, and it's important to tell the difference. <clears throat> and if there's an alveolar problem, then the sternomastoid muscles here uh, may be overactive, but that is more typical of obstructive disease like asthma and so on, when he doesn't have any of that, and his trachea is central, 
so his lungs are clear in the front. We'll listen to his heart now, and for this, <clears throat> we'll get him to roll onto his left side a little bit, and put this pillow behind him here so he'll be comfortable, okay. And we first of all, we, we palpate the heart, and uh, I don't feel anything I'm feeling the left ventricle area, there's nothing there. And then I'm feeling here, the right ventricle area. The left ventricle is recognized by medial retraction, that is, the, the impulse tips like that, from lateral to medial, medial retraction. The right ventricle is recognized by lateral retraction, which means it goes like that. And the right ventricle is always uh, towards the midline from the left ventricle, so we can know which is which. And uh, <clears throat> then, in this position, we listen for the heart sounds. And we listen, first of all, to the second heart sound. And we should hear uh, a single sound, which would be bip, or we can hear a split, which would be blip. And uh, depending on the nature of these two sounds and where you hear them, a lot of information is obtained. So I listen and describe what I hear. Okay, his heart is normal. The second heart sound is split only in inspiration. And the first heart sound is split <clears throat> also. And uh, these are normal asynchronous beatings. The left ventricle contracts quicker and uh, or more early and uh, completes its contraction also early. So the right ventricle is behind it, and that's making the, the asynchronous beating of the, of the heart sound, so you get the blip, 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 that comes from that phenomenon. Okay, now we're ready to lie flat again, <coughs> and we do the abdomen. And the abdomen, <coughs> we look at it and see if we see anything particular, and we're looking for <coughs> tenderness, and tenderness with guarding means peritoneal irritation, and a very important sign. And it is completely soft everywhere. And <clears throat> we'll check the liver by finding a costal margin there, and then putting your finger there, take a big breath. Okay, that's normal. And then we go for the spleen, and we put one hand behind the, and take a big breath. And we don't feel the spleen or the liver. We try to feel the kidneys. And we don't feel anything there. And we don't feel anything there. The only circumstance where we feel kidneys is the polycystic kidney, which is a condition which uh, usually ends in death by about age 40. So the age of the patient helps in the diagnosis. Then we check here. This is to see if the bladder is emptying properly. If there's, if there's dullness here, there's either there's pregnancy or there's a full bladder. And now we're, we're um, if we were doing a neurologic examination, at this point we would measure the <clears throat> abdominal reflexes this way. And notice how the muscle contracts in response to that. If that was abnormal and there was no contraction, that would be sign of upper motor neuron disease. Now we're all 